Hi, I'm Dan. And I'm Jake, and we're both public high school teachers. The history of the American West is a complicated one. It's often portrayed as the noble struggle against nature, about plucky Americans setting out across the wilderness in search of making their own destiny on an open frontier. But the actual history is frequently violent. It includes the persecution of black Americans, of Mormons and Chinese immigrants. It includes the struggle of people forgotten by multiple governments as the borders of countries change multiple times over the course of a single life. And it includes the violent removal and genocide by the United States against Native Americans. One thing that we think American history classrooms do really poorly is portraying Indian history as just a series of tragedies that lead up to a veritable extinction in 1890. Native Americans are still here today. They're your neighbors, your teachers, your artists, your public officials. But the Sand Creek Massacre is a tragedy that we need to talk about. Sand Creek is one of the stories that made us want to call this channel Rewire to help us reconfigure how we have unconsciously thought about complex topics. Now, if you study the history of the American West, Sand Creek was a pivotal moment for the people of the tribes involved, for the U.S. Army, and for the territory of Colorado. But just like we said in our Ludlow Massacre video, in our very first video, Sand Creek isn't often taught in schools. It happened in our state, and we never really knew the story until we dove into it by ourselves as adults. In the last 150 years, Sand Creek has been portrayed as a battle and as a collision of cultures, but what actually happened was a brutal massacre committed by the United States military against a peaceful group of mostly women and children done for selfish political gain. Our goal with this YouTube channel is to talk about things we don't normally get to talk about with our students, so let's talk about it. We'd like to take you through this event through the eyes of a witness and victim, George Bent. So the fort was burned down in 1849 and then left there for about a hundred years. And then when our dad was a kid growing up across the highway, he would uh, ride his bike on the what was left of the adobe walls. And then it was rebuilt and became a National Historic Site in uh, 1976. George Bent was born on July 7th, 1843, at Bent's Fort in what is now southern Colorado, near La Junta, on the northern bank of the Arkansas River. Even though the fort sits just a stone's throw away of what was at the time Mexico, Bent's Fort wasn't a military installation. It was a trading post. George's father, William Bent, was one of the most powerful fur traders in the entire western U.S., trading beaver and buffalo pelts here at what Indians called Bent's Big Lodge. We've been coming here our whole lives as our family has farms right across the highway. George's mother, Owl Woman, was Cheyenne and raised George as a young Cheyenne in the shadow of the fort, which was a bustling place where people of many walks of life came together. Bent's Fort was an important stop on the Santa Fe Trail and saw many Native American tribes, trappers, businessmen, and soldiers pass through it. As such, George spent his life with one foot in the world of white settlers and one in the world of the Cheyenne. Later educated in Missouri, George spoke seven different languages, English, Cheyenne, French, Spanish, Arapaho, Kiowa, and Comanche, all fluently. As an adult, George was a very complicated person. He was college educated in St. Louis, but never really felt at home amongst the white members of his university. George had seen too many lessons about the cultural superiority of white people and often admired Indians who chose not to participate in white society, like his stepmother, Island. He fought for the Confederacy in the Civil War after he witnessed a group of Union troops fire into a crowd in Missouri. As kids, we loved coming to Bent's Fort. It really captured our imaginations. But as adults, it's been difficult to reckon with the fact that some of our childhood heroes fought to uphold slavery 
especially when they fought so vigorously for Native American rights. After fighting in the Civil War, George returned to Colorado. He lived with his little brother Charlie's mother, Yellow Woman, as a member of Chief Black Kettle's Cheyenne Band. Along with Black Kettle and his father William, he pushed for peace between the Cheyenne, Arapaho, and the U.S. government in what U.S. history commonly calls the American Indian Wars. Black Kettle was a peace chief for the Cheyenne and Arapaho, always trying to make inroads with the white government, but often met with frustrating lack of progress. Between 1776 and the end of the Civil War, 368 treaties were agreed upon between native tribes and the American government. Most of those, however, were broken by the U.S. But Black Kettle was stalwart in his belief, saying, it is not my intention or wish to fight the whites. I want to be friendly and peaceable and keep my tribe so. I want to live in peace. Specifically, the Treaty of Fort Wise in 1861 drastically reduced tribal lands in an already lopsided agreement. The Cheyenne were required to allow a lengthy list of things like allowing safe passage for white settlers, the construction of roads and post offices on their land, and paying for any alleged wrongdoing by tribes' members. All the U.S. promised was to deliver annuities to the tribes if the Cheyenne upheld their agreements and offered protection from white settlers. The Treaty of Fort Wise not only decimated the lands belonging to the Cheyenne in the government's eyes, but the land chosen was picked specifically because it had almost no buffalo, which was their main food source. The goal of the treaty was to make the tribes dependent on the government and squeeze them into a place where they would be more ready to make deals, not in their interests, which is something the Colorado territorial government took advantage of. In June of 1864, Governor of Colorado Territory John Evans addressed the friendly Indians of the Plains, calling them to Fort Lyon for peace talks. Governor Evans promised safety and provisions to those tribes that did this. George Bent noted, however, that the Cheyenne had been attacked again and again that summer, completely without cause. George couldn't help but mark in his mind how many times his people had pushed for a more lasting peace between themselves and the white settlers, only to be betrayed, fired upon, or moved once again. But by living with Black Kettle's group, it was clear that part of George held out hope. In October, as part of Chief Black Kettle's attempts for peace, he led about 600 Southern Cheyenne people, along with many Arapaho, to Fort Lyon, not that far from Ben's Fort, in order to parlay with the government. For reasons of safety, Black Kettle's band was moved about 40 miles north to a horseshoe-shaped bend in the Big Sandy Creek. Bluffs lined the west side of the creek along the sandy beds that gave the creek its name. On September 28th, Black Kettle, along with six other chiefs, including White Antelope, Bull Bear, and One Eye, made the trip to Denver to negotiate a more permanent peace with the white men. It was a futile effort, though. While Major Edward Winecoop, who had gained the trust of peace chiefs like White Antelope, tried to progress talks with the army, he was stonewalled, with one general sending a telegraph in October saying, I want no peace till the Indians suffer more. So after it was a fort, Fort Lyon became a VA hospital for a while and a mental hospital. And today it's a sort of convalescent kind of escape for people experiencing homelessness. And these, uh, these red buildings here were built between 1929 and 1945. We often think of the Civil War as something that happened just in the southern and eastern United States, but there were some key events that took place as far out west as Colorado and Arizona. The Battle of Glorietta Pass in 1862 was one of those events, making a war hero of one Reverend Colonel John Milton Shivington, who is the villain of our story. Actually, I want to walk that statement back a little bit. 
Shivington was the commander of the troops that fired upon the peaceful villages at Sand Creek. And he was a cruel man who deserves to go down in history, not as a war hero, but as a butcher. But in a larger sense, the villain of this story is the Civil War era United States. Ari Kelman contextualizes the massacre against its Civil War backdrop within his book, A Misplaced Massacre, more than most historians do. The mechanism of the Civil War effort, in tandem with the Indian Wars, is what created the violence on friendly Native people. This aggression, he paraphrases from George Bent, was born in the hothouse of the Civil War, as white racial anxiety ran rampant at the time, fostering paranoia and misapprehensions about Indian identity. Sand Creek was just one symptom of the United States working blindly for its expansionist cause. It is not the work of one rabid army unit, but of imperialism itself. John Shivington was a fire and brimstone preacher who, it's been said, would speak from his pulpit along with two loaded revolvers. Unfortunately, there's actually no historical evidence to support that claim. Curiously, Shivington was a fierce abolitionist who also saw killing Indians as God's work. You might have heard the quote, the only good Indian is a dead Indian. Well, that's a misquote, but it also comes from Shivington. A little powder and lead was the best food for Indians, according to Shivington. The whole summer of 1864, Shivington was waging a very personal war against Native Americans. At the same time, Governor John Evans had called for peaceful chiefs to lead their people to Fort Lyon, which is where I'm standing now. He issued a proclamation to white citizens of Colorado Territory. The proclamation authorized all citizens of Colorado, either individually or in such parties as they may organize, to go in pursuit of hostile Indians of the plains, to kill and destroy as enemies of the country, wherever they may be found. Unfortunately, Evans considered all tribes who had decided not to go to Fort Lyon as hostile Indians. Shivington and Evans worked in tandem to do their best to drive all Indians off the Colorado Plains, despite the tribes largely considering themselves to be at a momentary peace with the U.S. Black Kettle, George Bent, and William Bent even sent letters with runners to their groups across the plains hunting buffalo, urging them to come to Fort Lyon. But they were not always able to beat the hostile white forces, who they called gangs of bluecoats. The bluecoats were gaining strength quickly, thanks to a surge in forces called the Hundred Dazers, or Thirdsters. The army collected a volunteer 100-day cavalry with the express purpose of hunting and killing Indians. The Hundred Dazers, or more accurately, the Third Colorado Cavalry, were a unit that were collected following the Hungate Massacre, where a family of four near Denver had been killed by four Arapaho. In many of the sources we've read about Sand Creek, the Hundred Dazers are portrayed as a ragtag group of thugs, but the rangers at the Sand Creek Massacre National Historic Site helped us understand that's actually a misconception. The soldiers of the 3rd Cavalry were from various professions like mining and ranching, and were a cross-section of the kind of people you would find in Denver at the time. Though Army personnel took note of their at times wild and unprofessional nature, with Captain Silas Sewell, who we'll see more of from in a moment, calling them a mob. Colonel Shivington was in charge of the 100 Dazers, and in November of 1864, came into an additional 200 men at Fort Lyon with the permission from Major Scott Anthony. Shivington was now in command of nearly 700 soldiers. Winning the Battle of Glorietta Pass made Shivington a war hero, but he had political ambitions that didn't end there. If he could have just one more glorious victory, he thought, that might fuel his political career all the way to Congress. He imagined that victory coming against the Indians camped at Sand Creek. Peace talks in Denver lasted only a single day. Those in attendance included Shivington, Governor Evans, and Major Winecoop, some other military men, and Indian agents for the U.S., while Black Kettle, White Antelope, and others spoke for the tribes. The chiefs had gone to great lengths to prove to Winecoop how committed they were to peace, but Winecoop had no authority to declare a peace agreement. When the peace talks abruptly ended, all of the Indian chiefs left confused as to whether or not they had made peace. 
What they did know was that Edward Winecoop in Denver was an ally, and Shivington was not. By mid-November of 1864, the Cheyenne had been camped at Sand Creek for at least a month. The ground had hardened around them, while the gray and brown color palette that dominates Colorado's eastern plains during the winter began to set in. The rations and supplies that they had been promised had not come, and the group of mostly women, children, and the elderly was tired and cold. Black Kettle still hoped that Winecoop would come help them. Instead, Winecoop's command was taken over by Major Scott J. Anthony, whose first order was to cut the Arapaho's rations and demand their weapons. All the Arapaho had to give him were three rifles, one pistol, and 60 bows. Anthony promised more safety for the Arapaho and Cheyenne in the area, all the while authorizing his troops to shoot at Indians because they had annoyed him enough. People like Anthony and Shivington exhibited a clear disdain for the native people they had been tasked with guarding and routinely acted against their commission without repercussions. Meanwhile, those at Sand Creek considered moving themselves far south of the Arkansas River, where they would be further away from the army. But Major Anthony's assurances, which of course they didn't know were lies, caused them to decide to stay at Sand Creek for the winter. On November 27th, two days before the attack, Anthony allowed a single trading wagon to go to Sand Creek. Sometime around then, Shivington sent a detachment of 20 men to William Bent's ranch nearby and surrounded it, threatening to shoot anyone who tried to leave. Knowing that William was an Indian agent and that he would try to help his sons George and Charlie at Sand Creek, Shivington had him pinned in his cabin. On November 28th, Shivington arrived at Fort Lyon, along with 600 men, many of which were 100 daysers. They were greeted warmly at Fort Lyon, where Major Anthony told Shivington that every man there was eager to join his expedition against the Indians. Anthony wasn't quite right, though. There were three officers, Captain Silas Sewell, Lieutenant Joseph Kramer, and Lieutenant James Connor, who raised protest about the planned attack. Sewell, in particular, told Shivington that the Indians at the creek were peaceful and likened them more to prisoners than enemy combatants. Shivington was incensed at their insubordination. He slammed his fists on the table and yelled, damn any man who sympathizes with Indians. I have come to kill Indians, and I believe it is right and honorable to use any means under God's heaven to kill Indians. Before the attack, Sewell, Kramer, and Connor quietly ordered their men in their units not to fire except in self-defense. At 8 p.m. on November the 28th, 1864, 750 men left Fort Lyon for Sand Creek with 12 cannons in tow. To guide them, Shivington had mountain man, explorer, and mixed-race fur trader Medicine Calf Jim Beckworth. However, Beckworth was 69 years old and going blind and aching from rheumatism. Realizing before they reached Fort Lyon that Beckworth really wouldn't work out as a guide to the creek, Shivington's band had stopped at a nearby ranch telling that rancher to guide the army under the threat of hanging. The rancher was Robert Bent, William's oldest son. Robert begrudgingly complied, leading them across the plains and through some shallow lakes that dot the land north of Fort Lyon. Some soldiers suspected that he was trying to get their ammunition wet and ruin the paper cartridges. Robert would soon be reunited with his younger brothers at Sand Creek. On the morning of November 29th, the sun had not yet risen on the camps in Sand Creek's Horseshoe Bend. The Cheyennes slept in their lodges with Black Kettle's teepee at the center. A little to the east was Left Hand's Arapaho village. To those who were up first, they were awakened by what sounded like a herd of buffalo approaching from the south. This would be good news. Buffalo meant food. But over a hill that impeded the Cheyenne sight lines, the army had dropped their heavier luggage and posted some of the less experienced troops to try to capture Cheyenne and Arapaho horses on the bluffs to the south of the camp. The soldiers then mounted up and rode toward the creek from the southeast. Those in the camp quickly realized the herd of buffalo approaching was actually a group of men on horseback. Upon realizing it was the United States Army, they thought, surely this must be a mistake, and hoped that the soldiers would realize they were a peaceful village before firing. George Bent had just awoken and was still wrapped in blankets when the massacre began. He observed, from down the creek, a large body of troops was advancing at a rapid trot. 
More soldiers could be seen making for the pony herds to the south of the camps. In the camps themselves, all was confusion and noise. Men, women, and children rushing out of the lodges, partly dressed, women and children screaming at the sight of the troops. Black Kettle stood outside his tent, underneath an American flag on a pole. Black Kettle remembered what officials in Denver had told him, that as long as his people were flying the Stars and Stripes, they would not be harmed. He called out for his people not to be afraid, that the soldiers would not hurt them when the troops opened fire on both sides of the camp. Upon hearing the gunshots, the hundred dazers who had been left to capture horses mounted up for fear of missing out on their chance to kill Indians. They would approach from the south or the southwest, pincering the camp and further increasing casualties. Black Kettle also ran a white flag of surrender up his flagpole. Robert Bent recalled that the flags were in so conspicuous a position that they were impossible to miss. It was absolutely clear to everyone that the Cheyenne and Arapaho posed no threat. White Antelope, with his hands raised, began running towards the soldiers. According to Beckworth, White Antelope yelled, stop, stop, in plain English. George Bent remembers White Antelope even saying aloud, soldiers no hurt me, soldiers my friend. When he realized the attack was not an accident and the army was not going to stop, he folded his arms and sang the Cheyenne death song. Nothing lives long, only the earth and the mountains. Over the next six to 10 hours, 230 Cheyenne and Arapaho people, mostly women, children, and the elderly, were killed mercilessly by the army. According to several accounts, almost no bodies went unmutilated and body parts were collected by the soldiers as trophies. The books we've read on Sand Creek offer extremely graphic accounts of the violence that took place, but it doesn't feel appropriate to repeat those here. Just know that the actions of the army were cruel, gratuitous, and merciless. As the army fired, George Bent and Black Kettle fled north along the river, crossing the bluffs to the east side of Sand Creek, and then hid in the sand pits along one of the banks for many hours. Upon reaching the pits, George felt the pain of a bullet chew through his leg. George ducked down into the pit while bleeding from his new wound. George was enraged by the actions of the army, especially because he knew exactly how much Black Kettle and Left Hand had pushed for peace when he felt another bullet land in the sand next to him. He jumped out of the pit and shouted at the soldiers in front of him, come on, you goddamn white sons of bitches, and kill me if you are a brave man. But an artillery shell exploded above the soldiers, chasing them off. During the massacre, Captain Sewell looked to Lieutenant Kramer and said, I am ashamed of this, and would later call the massacre an ambush of innocence. Sewell tried to help take Charlie Bent away from the massacre and was denied by Shivington. Shivington eventually acquiesced to Sewell's request, and Charlie, who had watched his friend Jack Smith gunned down in his teepee, went briefly into Sewell's custody. As the darkness of night set in, the massacre trailed off until only a few stray gunshots pierced the silence of the prairie. Black Kettle managed to go back to the village and find his wife, who was miraculously still alive, though wounded. George and Black Kettle led the survivors through the night away from the camp until they met up with others who hadn't been camped at Sand Creek. George remembered, that was the worst night I ever went through. There we were, without any shelter whatsoever, and not a stick of wood to build a fire with. The men and women who were not wounded worked all through the night, trying to keep the children and wounded from freezing to death. All through the night, the Indians kept hallooing to attract the attention of those who had escaped from the village to the open plain and were wandering about in the dark, lost and freezing. Few were found alive, for the soldiers had done their work thoroughly. But now and then, during that endless night, some man or woman would stagger in among us, carrying some wounded person on their back. Shivington and his men stayed in the area near Sand Creek for the next day or two, killing a few more people that they could find. On November 30th, Lieutenant Kramer was given the order to burn down what remained of the Cheyenne village, and he set all of the lodges aflame. Now, we shot some video here without speaking, and we're doing voiceover back at home because after a certain point at the historic site, it asks for silence and respect. After you leave the ranger station, there's about a half-mile hike up to the Monument Hill, and there are a few signs along the way telling the story of the massacre. 
The Monument Hill overlooks where the attack happened with some of the bluffs we've mentioned there on the left side of your screen. The creek comes toward us and then swings to the right down the hill in front of us. This looks north, so Georgian Black Kettle escaped to the kind of top left of this shot along the bluffs there. There's not much of the river right now. And on the Monument Hill, there's an old marker and a seating area to hear the rangers talk. When we were there the most recent time to shoot this video, there are a few small tokens that look like they were from children at the historical marker as well. What we know about the events of the attack come from survivors like George Bent, who wrote extensively about the Cheyenne. Letters from Captain Sewell and Lieutenant Kramer were found in a desk in Denver in the year 2000 and further illuminated what happened here at Sand Creek. Shivington lied about the massacre in his official report. He claimed it was a battle waged against a hostile Indian tribe whose fighters numbered nearly a thousand and fought back fiercely. In reality, only nine U.S. soldiers were killed, mostly because of careless, friendly fire. Shivington called all nine of those fallen noble soldiers' deaths. The Rocky Mountain News reported with much fanfare that Colorado soldiers have again covered themselves in glory. In the life of George Bent, author George E. Hyde notes that Shivington's superiors were at first deceived as to the character of the affair. They believed the troops had been surprised by a hostile Indian camp, but the details of the massacre could not long be kept from leaking out. After a few weeks of nursing the bullet wound in his leg following the massacre, George rode for his father's ranch alongside his friend Howling Wolf, dodging soldier patrols the whole way. They arrived at the Bent Ranch as the family was sitting down to Christmas dinner, and George was scarcely recognized by his father William at first, as they were dressed in borrowed clothing and were thoroughly exhausted. Here, George rested for a few days. William explained to him that Robert had been forced to guide the army to the creek. George shared that Charlie had been released by Silas Sewell into the custody of his brother Robert, and the two brothers were soon reunited. George reflected on the massacre. His whole life, he had watched chiefs like Black Kettle, White Antelope, and Left Hand push for peace. Sand Creek was the final straw for him. On New Year's Day, 1865, George and Charlie Bent swore off the white half of their heritage and left their father's ranch for the final time, riding north toward the Dog Soldier Camp in Nebraska, near the Colorado and Kansas lines. Many of the survivors of Sand Creek did the same. George considered Sand Creek the moment that convinced even the most optimistic peace chiefs that there would be no peace with the U.S., and many joined up with war chiefs like Red Cloud and Roman Nose. A 24-year-old Cheyenne woman named Mochi joined Roman Nose and fought along her husband for the next 11 years. She is still the only Native American woman to have ever been held a prisoner of war by the United States. George Bent went on to ride with the Dog Soldiers, one of the foremost Native American groups to resist the United States. He was forthright in placing blame for the massacre not only on Shivington, but on the U.S. government officials who continually used violence to uproot the Plains tribes for the purpose of manifest destiny. Quoting Ari Kelman again, the massacre in this light looked less like a one-time event, an exception rather than the rule, and more like a predictable outgrowth of public policy. Charlie Bent fought alongside George and the Dog Soldiers and was killed three years after Sand Creek at about the age of 21, and George then became an interpreter. With his language skills and thorough education, along with his knowledge of both white culture and many Indian cultures, George spent the rest of his life helping preserve the history of the Cheyenne by writing letters and assisting with books, corresponding with various historians for over a decade. He died in the 1918 flu epidemic. Colonel Shivington maintained for the rest of his life that what happened at Sand Creek was not only a fierce battle, but self-defense writing that the first shot was fired by Indians, the first casualty was on his side, and that there was no white flag or sign of peace. He called the massacre a pacification that broke the Indian tribes and allowed for peace, when the opposite was true, and towns like Julesburg and Northeast Colorado were burned in retribution for Sand Creek. Congress's Joint Committee on the Conduct of War did denounce Shivington, calling his actions savage and cowardly, the government brought no charges against him or any of the other perpetrators. Shivington avoided court-martial by retiring from the army. <laughs>
His political aspirations were dashed, but he was never punished. He left the West for a while, but eventually he returned to Denver, where he was appointed undersheriff and died in the early 1890s. Captain Silas Sewell was killed in 1865, just a week after he had publicly testified against Shivington. Sand Creek has been misrepresented in history for a long time. Characterizing it as a battle is dishonest and disrespectful to those who were killed by the army that day. But the site even has an old historical marker reading, Sand Creek Battleground. As recently as the 2000s, there was serious pushback from locals and historians about whether or not Sand Creek was a massacre or a battle. And if you visit the site of the Wounded Knee Massacre on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota, you can see the word massacre obviously and somewhat clumsily bolted over the word battle on the sign, which is a great illustration of how poor a job United States citizens and our government has done to acknowledge and atone for these state-sponsored atrocities. Near to Sand Creek, the town of Lamar has the Savages as its high school mascot, and the nearest town to Sand Creek is named Shivington. So it's easy to feel like these events are completely forgotten, completely misunderstood, or that people just don't care. However, it does seem like Sand Creek is becoming more part of our public consciousness, at least here in Colorado. In the year 2000, Senator Ben Nighthorse Campbell read Silas Sewell and Joseph Kramer's letters aloud on the United States Senate floor, concluding, I do not know of any worse atrocity, frankly, in American history. The site of the massacre became a national historic site in 2007. There's been an effort to reinter remains of victims there, many of which were taken as trophies and displayed in bars and theaters in Denver for a century. Today, it sits a few miles east of the town of Eads, isolated on the prairie with cottonwoods dotting the length of the creek and the wind whistling through the grasses. I would encourage you to go, if you get the chance, listen to the park ranger presentation and reflect in solitude. In 2014, then Governor John Hickenlooper issued an official apology for the massacre. During the 2020 Black Lives Matter protests, a Civil War soldier statue at the Colorado State Capitol building was toppled. It now resides in the History Colorado Center, just a few blocks away, and will soon be replaced by a statue in memory of the massacre. Ironically, the History Colorado Center was met with a huge blowback when in 2012, it opened an exhibit on Sand Creek, which it chose to title Collision, with essentially no consultation from any Native American tribes. And on August 17th of 2021, current Governor Jared Polis officially rescinded John Evans' proclamation, calling for Colorado citizens to kill and destroy Indians of the Plains. And there are small things too. As recently as late October 2021, by the time this video was 99% of the way done, a Denver Public Library branch was renamed. William Byers was a defender of the Sand Creek Massacre, but now that library will carry the name of a Native American activist. It'll soon be donning signs saying Thunderbird Man Branch after John M. Hula Jr. Uh, this, this library named after somebody who's done a lot of good. So, this is history. It's our history, and it's yours too if you're American. It's important that we teach it because it does a really thorough job of showing not only how incomplete our understanding of history can be, but how history doesn't fit neatly into little boxes for us to compartmentalize. After the My Lai massacre in Vietnam, Time Magazine ran an editorial that seemed to echo Sand Creek, saying, only the nation that has faced up to its own failings and acknowledged its capacities for evil and ill-doing has any real claim to greatness. Americans, myself included, want to think of the Civil War as a wholly moral effort that fought hard to expand the American dream to those who had long been denied any access to it at all. But as Sand Creek poignantly reminds us, it's just not that simple.